Namaste. Thank you so much for joining us uh, once again on the third of this uh, webinar series on the 1971 uh, War of Bangladesh uh, Liberation. Uh, the Swarnam Vijay Varsh, which uh, the Indian government uh, is celebrating, of course, uh, in partnership with, uh, with our great friends, uh, the Bangladesh uh, government. And uh, uh, you, you would have seen uh, the first two uh, webinars on this series. The first one, uh, covered uh, the attack on uh, the Karachi port uh, when the Indian Navy uh, bombed and uh, blockaded, uh, in effect, the Karachi uh, port, which was the hub of uh, Pakistan naval operations. And in the second uh, webinar, uh, you would have uh, seen uh, the aircraft carrier operations on uh, the East uh, Pakistan, which was former Bangladesh, or rather Bangladesh's former uh, identity was East Pakistan. You would have seen uh, the uh, the uh, the coverage of uh, the aircraft carrier operations which bombed Pakistani uh, installations uh, there and now uh, in this uh, third uh, webinar uh, we are uh, we are covering uh, you know we are actually working with a book Operation X to cover uh, various naval smaller naval operations that happened which went right into the heart of uh, the Pakistani army and naval forces uh, on East Pakistan which helped. Uh, with, of course, uh, the drive of uh, the Mukti Baini. Uh, we will cover all of this in detail, which helped the liberation of Bangladesh. And uh, to cover this uh, webinar uh, in detail, uh, to helm it, uh, rather is my partner in crime, uh, Commodore Shrikant Kesnur. If we can have him up on stage, please. Hi, Shrikant. How are you? Wonderful to see you, Amish. Good evening to you and to all our audience. Uh, it's great to come back and wonderful to connect again. Thanks, thanks, Shikant. If I may do the uh, formalities and your introduction for our audiences, all of all of them would know you in any case. Uh, they have seen the first two webinars, but let me just do the formalities with your permission. Commodore Shikant Kesnur, an alumnus of the prestigious National Defense Academy, was commissioned in the Indian Navy in July 1986. In his 36-year career, 36 years, he lives in a fridge clearly. He has had extensive experience in maritime operations, training, leadership, diplomacy, and communication. He has been the, the captain of two frontline ships, and in addition, his tours of duties uh, have uh, witnessed several important assignments, prestigious courses, and interesting tenures at sea, ashore, and abroad. He was also the defense advisor at the High Commission of India in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, with Kenya, Tanzania, Seychelles, Eritrea, and Somalia as his area of responsibility. He has a PhD from Mumbai University, apart from five postgraduate degrees in science and social sciences. Uh, he has been senior faculty at Navy military colleges and training institutions. He's also been the lead writer and chief editor of 11 books. That's more than the number of books that I've written and many journals for the Indian Navy. In addition, he has been involved with several academic, creative and corporate outreach endeavors of the Navy. He is presently the director of Maritime Warfare Center, Mumbai, and also the officer in charge of the Naval History Project. He has been confirmed the Vishisht uh, Seva Medal, uh, VSM, in the Republic Day Awards last year. Pleasure to have you again, uh, Shrikant. You, you uh, honor the Nehru Center stage by joining us once again. Thank you so much. My, my privilege, my honor entirely. And you're talking about books, uh, uh, and certainly while I have uh, helmed some, I think I'm very excited to talk about today's topic because it's all about a wonderful book. And uh, I know that you're also excited to sort of discuss it because this is a book uh, that is that is a military thriller uh, 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 genre that's not not too prominent in India. And at the same time, it's completely sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's it's factual. It's not fiction. So it's a wonderful book that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and and I'm I'm really waiting to discuss that along with you and along with one of the co-authors and one of the protagonists of the story. So so what do you say to that? It's a fantastic. Looking forward to it. So I'd love to uh, call in Sandeep Unithan on uh, stage first. Hi, a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks uh, for the uh, to the Nehru Center for having me over here. Hello, uh, Commodore uh, Kesnur. It's a pleasure to be 
meeting you again after uh, Jaipur. <laughs> yeah, good to, good to see you, Sandeep, yeah. after Jaipur and, and pleasure to connect again. Before the two of you run away with the conversation, this is a Sarkari place. I will do the formalities. Sandeep Punethan is uh, editor, News 19 Plus. He's an author and journalist who has covered the defense beat for nearly two decades. His first book, Black Tornado, The Three Sieges uh, of uh, Mumbai 2611, describes the Nove November 26, 2008 terror attacks. His second, Operation X, co-authored with Captain MNR Samant, MVC details a covert maritime warfare unit run by the Indian Navy during the 1971 Indo-Pak War. And Srikant, if you could invite our other guest. Yes, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amish, this is so wonderful because we, at one level, we got a young person who's authored a book uh, about the 71 war and about a secret mission that very few know about. And our second panelist is someone who's actually a part of that. So it's my sort of proud privilege to introduce uh, Commander Vijay Kapil, uh, Veer Chakra, now Sena Medal Gallantry. Can we have him uh, uh, in front? so that I can tell our audience about him. Now, Welcome, sir. sir. Welcome, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you, uh, Kapil, sir. And, and uh, so nice to connect. Thank you very much for inviting me. Honored to be here in this forum. Yes. So to our audience, uh, Commander Vijay Kapil is a war hero. He joined the Indian Navy in 1966. And within a couple of years after that, was sent to the United Kingdom for training in diving. Uh, so he was amongst our, amongst our pioneers in the diving branch. And having completed his training, he came back to India to establish the fleet clearance diving team. Uh, this was sometime in 1970. In April 1971, he was called for a secret mission amongst the few who took part in it and about which we will be talking in detail later. And he will explain it himself. Uh, suffice it to say here that at the end of the war, he was awarded the Veer Chakra for his gallant exploits. Thereafter, uh, Commander Kapil went on to do a second specialization in anti-submarine warfare and, um, you know, did lots of appointments on ships as an anti-submarine warfare officer. He went on to command INS Vidyut. Now, incidentally, Vidyut was also a part of the 1971 war, a missile boat. Uh, thereafter, uh, Sir also commanded INS Abhimanyu, which is like the alma mater of our diving fraternity. He also taught uh, at the diving school in Kochi. And uh, in the last decade of his career, he did appointments in Delhi uh, in the Directorate of Combat Policy and Tactics and later in the Directorate of Diving, uh, where he sort of steered the policy towards the growth of the diving branch of the Indian Navy. And then, of course, he would have been very, very happy with the birth of the uh, IMSF, uh, now called the Marcos, uh, in the late 80s, just when he was sort of retiring from the Navy. I'm sure he had a role to play in that too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, apart from the Veer Chakra, Commander Kapil was also honored with the Nausena Medal Gallantry uh, in the mid-70s for his diving action in Gujarat. So we've got uh, a, a double gallantry award winner a war hero with us. Uh, what more can we ask for? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Commander Vijay Kapil. Commander Kapil, Commander Kapil, sir, honor to have you on the Nehru Center stage, sir. There are, My uh, pleasure, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Amish, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful having Commander Kapil and Sandeep. I'm so much looking forward to this discussion with you. Uh, but before that, we have Commodore Anil Jaggi, uh, the Naval Advisor in the High Commission of India at London. Uh, he will explain to us the geography and give us a feeling of the terrain so that all of us uh, are oriented towards the uh, uh, arena of the battle and what really happened. So uh, Commodore Jaggi has done this in previous episodes also very beautifully. And I'm looking forward to what he has to say about the battle arena. Over to you, Commodore Jaggi. Thank you, Komodo Kesnur. Let me now provide the listeners with an overview of the geographical aspects and other peculiarities of two very daring operations of the 1971 Liberation War of Bangladesh, namely the Operation X or Jackpot 
and the force alpha operations. The major part of Bangladesh lies in the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna Delta, or the GBM Delta. It is Asia's largest and world's most populated delta and encompasses approximately 1 lakh square kilometers of Bangladesh and West Bengal in India. The region is also subject to floods caused by monsoons, heavy runoff, and tropical cyclones. Major ports and waterways of Bangladesh, which are located in the region, are Chittagong, Dhaka, Narayan Ganj, Chelna, and Mongla, to name a few. East Pakistan was, and Bangladesh today, is still a very diverse region, roughly divided into four divisions, Khulna, Rajshahi, Dhaka, and Chittagong. These are bisected by giant rivers, Padma, Jamuna, and Meghna. The riverine terrain, vast area of forest and saltwater swamps of the Sundarbans, strong tidal variations and river flows, and the shallow depths along with the shifting sandbanks pose unique challenges and difficulties for navigation and diving operations in the channels and waterways of this region. Let me now briefly touch upon the two noteworthy operations which are unsung but had a significant impact on the conflict in East Pakistan. Much before the commencement of the conflict, and especially after India closed its airspace to Pakistani aircraft in April 1971, sea lanes of communication or the sea routes became even more vital for resupplying Pakistan's entire Eastern military garrison. It was therefore very clear to the Indian Navy that the ports and waterways would have to be disrupted if India had to realize her maritime military objectives in East Pakistan. Since regular forces could not be utilized, the onus therefore rested with the Naval Liberation Force or the Mukti Bahini Naval Commando Team, who were completely committed and devoted towards realizing their dream of a free Bangladesh. With this as the intent and objective, Operation X was conceived by the Indian Navy. The operation aimed at converting the East Pakistani refugees and volunteers into a very capable force of Marine commandos. The eight courageous PNS Mangro crew who had defected formed the nucleus of the Mukti Bahaini Naval Commando team. Dedicated and exhaustive training for this transition was provided by the Indian Navy Special Forces equivalent, that is, a small corps of clearance divers. On implementation of the plan, specially chosen diving officers and sailors of the Indian Navy were deputed to take on the wondrous task of training the Mukti Bahaini Naval Commando team. For the purpose of undertaking the training, a campsite was chosen near the village of Palashi, or Palasi, where over two centuries ago, the history of the subcontinent had taken a decisive turn in the Battle of Palasi. The camp was set up on the Indian side at a location on the eastern river bank of Bhagirathi, a distributary of the river Ganges. The site was chosen as it provided conditions and features comparable to the actual conditions which the Mukti Bahini commandos would face in actual operations. The Mukti Bahini Jodhas were trained in endurance swimming while carrying a three or four kg limpet mine strapped around their waist. They were also trained in free diving and most importantly in the use of explosives including the limpet mines. After intensive training and preparations when the Mukti Bahini Naval Commando teams were ready, it was decided to launch Operation Jackpot on the night of 14th and 15th August 1971. For Operation Jackpot, four targets, namely the ports of Chantpur, Chalna Mongla Complex, Narayan Ganj, and Chittagong were chosen. The operation resulted in the blowing up of ships, support vessels, and port infrastructure vital to the Pakistani military. 457 Bengali naval commandos destroyed nearly 1 lakh tons of ships in the sea and river ports 
of East Pakistan between August and December 1971. The debris disrupted shipping while sustained sabotage by the naval commandos kept merchant ships away, severely hampered the war effort in East and demoralized the Pakistani troops there. Another operation which will be covered in today's webinar is about the offensive maritime operations by Indian Navy's Force Alpha. Force Alpha was a makeshift arrangement of a maritime task force for conducting operations in the East Pakistan riverine waterways. It comprised of four small ships which made a big mark during the 1971 conflict. The force included two gunboats of the flower class, Padma and Palash loaned from the West Bengal government, Chitrangada, a watercraft of the border security force, and INS Panvel, a seaver defense boat of the Indian Navy, which was the command ship of the group. The four vessels had limited surface engagement capability, but this shortcoming was more than overcome by the josh and motivation of the crew. The force was manned by Indian Navy personnel and the large majority were Mukti Bahini men. The task that the small naval force was assigned was to undertake maritime attack on the port complex of Chalna and Mongla and deliver an offensive on the adversary from the sea, thereby dislocating its forces as well as crippling the war waging potential which was being sustained through these crucial river harbors of the East Pakistan. The force departed on the morning of 7 December 71 from Hasnabad, a river port on the Indian side, and traveled several miles in the Sundarbans Delta and through Pusur River. Force Alpha faced many challenges, such as remaining inconspicuous to the Pakistani direction finding teams, routing through unfamiliar, narrow, and complicated waterways of the Sundarbans, at times in pitch dark nights, and the difficulties of navigation in riverine waters with only army ordnance maps at their disposal. The most decisive phase of operations was encountered by the force when it decided to launch a waterborne offensive on the Pakistani army garrison at Khulna. During this phase, Force Alpha faced stiff opposition from the enemy facing incessant firing from the shore. Against all odds, and in spite of suffering casualties and injuries, fortune favored the brave men of Force Alpha. With their sheer grit and determination, the force destroyed the land fortifications of the adversary, severely damaged the shipyard and shore facilities, and imposed heavy losses on the shore defense of Pakistani army. Let's hear more of these operations during the webinar. Jai Hind. If I may, uh, Sandeep, with your permission, if I may jump in with a question to uh, Shrikant, with your permission, to Sandeep first. Uh, Sandeep, you co-authored this book with the late Captain uh, MNR Samant. Uh, we will, of course, we will be discussing uh, uh, the late captain also soon. But for uh, the benefit of our uh, audiences, if you could tell us uh, uh, briefly what the book is all about, what is it covering? Thank you, Amish. Uh, well, Operation X talks about a covert naval warfare unit that was set up by the Directorate of Naval Intelligence, the Indian Navy's DNI, in 1971. Uh, it was set up in the run-up to the 1971 war in about April of 1971. And uh, it was tasked with waging a, a irregular war against East Pakistan. Now, uh, the kind of war uh, that they waged uh, in between August and December is outstanding in sheer size, scale, and impact because these kind of operations have not been done in possibly in the history of naval warfare in the 20th century. I'll just explain how. Uh, uh, a very small core of uh, uh, diving officers like Commander Kapil, who we have here, who incidentally is not only a double gallantry award winner, but is also a war hero in two countries, India, where uh, he was part of the Indian Navy, of course, and Bangladesh, which he helped create. So that's a very rare honor to have someone like that 
Now, uh, this uh, small unit of uh, comprising naval divers uh, uh, that was set up in April, uh, you know, they train over 400 uh, East Pakistani Bengali youth. Uh, this was the naval wing of the Mukti Bahini. But between August and November of 1971, they sank something like 100,000 tons of merchant shipping inside East Pakistan. They literally crippled the ports and waterways of East Pakistan, and they dealt a deadly blow to the logistics of um, East Pakistan. As you know, both wings of uh, Pakistan, West and East, were separated by 1,600 kilometers of Indian territory. And uh, by early 1971, the air links had been severed, which meant that they had to fly around the landmass of India. And the only uh, avenue for them for the West Pakistani dictatorship to resupply East Pakistan was through the sea. And that meant using merchant ships. And these merchant ships not only brought in troops from West Pakistan, but they also uh, exported the main foreign, foreign exchange earnings from uh, uh, East Pakistan, later Bangladesh, which was jute and tea. Now, these uh, uh, maritime saboteurs that Commander Kapil's unit trained, over 400 of them, they inflicted deadly blows on these ships, these merchant ships, like sinking 100,000 tons of shipping between August and November, as I mentioned, it's remarkable. It's never been done in the history of naval warfare in the 20th century. And this was done by a force amounting to not more than 30 Indian Navy officers and men. I mean, it's remarkable for the number of uh, personnel that were deployed if you talk of your returns on investment of men and material, this is possibly the biggest operation of the 1971 war. So that, in short, is what these gallant men of naval commando operations did in the 1971 war. And this story, unfortunately, had never been told uh, thus far. I mean, if I were to uh, you, uh, you know, go back in, uh, in, into literature, I would say Mahabharat is the greatest story ever written. This Operation X is the Mahabharat that we didn't know of because it was covert. It, uh, all the men who participated in this operation, like uh, Commander Kapil, they were sworn to secrecy. But almost half a century later, thanks to my uh, late author, uh, uh, Captain MNR Samant, who decided to tell his story, thanks to him, that story is now in the public domain. And that's, in short, is what Operation X is all about. Fascinating. Fascinating. Shikant, over to you. This is, uh, I'm sure the audience already has tons of comments and uh, questions. Please start posting them up. But Shikant, over to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I think Sandeep has sort of framed it very beautifully and I'll go back to him. But first, let me ask uh, Commander Kapil. And sir, I'll broaden it now. Sandeep has spoken specifics and I will certainly ask you those specifics a little later. But I'm interested overall in the atmosphere and feel at that time. Now, you are a young man. And, and of course, Sandeep has talked about the amount of glory that you gathered. But I'm sure when you started off, you had no idea you're going to be a part of such exciting and eventful times. And then uh, war clouds were breaking over the horizon when you came back from uh, UK and started the fleet clearance diving team. There were tumultuous times that you stayed. Then you were taken in April for setting up this mission. What was the feeling for a young man? I mean, there was a backdrop of a genocide. There was an international situation. Uh, was there that sort of realization in the Navy then? Or you just went about doing your business? I'm more interested in how a young man got into the war and what were his feelings then? Uh, Shikan, uh, thank you. Uh, basically, it was um, um, a sudden call to come to Calcutta, uh, where um, Director Intelligence came and uh, briefed uh, Lieutenant Das, my colleague and my coursemate in the diving, was already there. And uh, he gave me a bit, bit of an inkling about it, but uh, uh, it was uh, told in a little more details by uh, Captain Mickey Roy at that time. Initially, it looked like a very mundane job, training of people, even though the tensions were building up and uh, um, Bombay situation was pretty tense uh, doing the anti-sabotage exercises and things like that. Um, Pakistan 
was known to have the midget submarines and the chariots, which are the offens offensive uh, vehicles for the clandestine operation. But uh, India, we had nothing. But this was the opportunity which fell into the laps of um, India, and Indian Navy was quick to realize it and uh, lap it up. Um, that we started training the Mukti Bhaini and um, uh, started the facility to, to uh, churn out these um, uh, fine, brave, young Bengali uh, waterborne saboteurs. But looking that back later, at looking back at it, um, one um, phase that one was fortunate, privileged, and as proud of uh, being a part of this lovely team. That's wonderful, sir. Fortunate and privileged. Now, let me just, just go to uh, Sandeep Amish and then, then hand back to you. Sandeep, you sort of made a wonderful statement. You said this is the Mahabharat that was never told. And of course, uh, the book is a, I mean, it makes for very compelling reading. And we were discussing the other day also that, that uh, the amount of uh, shipping that was sunk uh, is, is a record. Uh, and you came upon this story just in a mention by Mickey Roy vaguely in his book. So why don't you sort of flesh it out for our listeners? Uh, why was this? Now, you've given a broad canvas, but why was it so essential to bring out this story? Particularly because uh, the foreword of your own book says, by G. Parthasati, it says that People are aware of what the Army and Air Force had done, not so much what the Navy had done. So I want you to tell our listeners what made it so necessary to write this book and what was the hook, what, what made you sink your teeth into it? Well, uh, uh, Srikant, uh, as you correctly mentioned, Admiral Mihir Roy uh, first mentioned this operation in his book. And Admiral uh, Mihir Roy was then Captain... Mickey Roy, uh, of uh, the, he was the director of naval intelligence in 1971. And indeed, he was the man who actually planned this whole operation. He wrote the foundation paper for this called Water Rat uh, in April of 1971. And he was the guy who, you know, uh, set out this whole mission, how they were to raise these uh, uh, Bengali saboteurs and attack, uh, you know, uh, shipping in, inside East Pakistan in very minute detail. So that was the whole uh, trigger for this. And Admiral Roy mentioned this uh, operation in his book in 19, uh, which was released in the Silver Jubilee of the 1971 war in 1996, you know, called War in the Indian Ocean. But never once did he mention there that he was the mastermind of the whole operation. He gave full credit to the Bangladeshi uh, youth, the Mukti Bahaini, the naval wing of the Mukti Bahaini. But at the same time, uh, Srikant, he left these little breadcrumbs for scholars to follow. Like, you know, there was little clues in his book where he says that uh, it would be interesting to find out where the, where these uh, naval commandos got their minds from, etc., etc. So I just did that, exactly what he mentioned. I just followed the trail of breadcrumbs and lo and behold, I uh, met with uh, his uh, deputy, that's uh, uh, Captain MNR Samant, who was the man on the ground, the operations man on the ground, uh, who was the boss of uh, Commander Kapil. Uh, he was based in Fort William. And uh, it's a very unique kind of an operation. This You had uh, uh, naval officers uh, working under the Indian Army, uh, you know, carrying out uh, uh, land training of the Mukti Bhaini, who were then going to be employed in the River Rhine waterways. It's, it's like we talk about jointmanship and all uh, today. It's the buzzword. Uh, this was being done on an extraordinary scale in 1971, where you had the Army, Navy, and the Air Force all working together uh, to meet a common objective. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, if I may just uh, clarify for the audiences who don't know, jointmanship refers to uh, the three wings, Army, Navy, uh, uh, Air Force, working uh, together. Uh, it's one of the uh, things that's important in the... in. Uh, uh, in, in armed forces warfare, in warfare these days. Uh, and yes, Sandeep has raised a very important point. Uh, Commander Kapil, sir, if I could uh, come to you. Uh, when you met the Mukti uh, Yodhas at uh, Camp Plassey. So I have two questions. One, this Camp Plassey, is it the same Plassey where the British won uh, the Battle of uh, Plassey? And second, when you met uh, the Mukti Yodhas, uh, what are the what were they like? What are the they had suffered and Bangladesh had suffered greatly under West Pakistan. 
uh, among the worst genocides of the 20th century uh, was carried out by west pakistan on bangladeshis 3 million bangladeshis were killed uh, uh, in 1971 it's it's unfortunate that the rest of the world simply does not know or doesn't care about this bangladeshi high commission does a lot of programs on trying to get people to be aware of this so were they angry were they demotivated were they charged what are they like sir if you could answer both these questions please right uh, first coming to the the um, site of pulasi Yes, it was uh, the the um, uh, famous uh, place, Plassey, where Lord Clive and um, Sharaz Shah Dawla's uh, forces fought. In uh, history of Bengal, changed from there onwards. So, if I may, uh, if I may cut in, just just as an author, that's kind of poetic. The land where Bengal lost its independence to the British is the very place. A few centuries later, is where their freedom was revived. and the right. indians helped uh, uh it was coincidence it's, it's just uh, poetic in a way <laughs> that's right I mean, like it's uh, it had to happen some something reverse at the same place where they start i guess so um uh, while while um, basically the background was that basically when me and samir das uh, when we were looking for proper place to train um where the what body is there away from the uh, prying eyes not um, a lot of place for ex, uh, expansion things like that um major roy choudhury of the charlie sector who later became uh, jal choudhury in command in the indian army he was uh, coordinating uh, with us and he took us to this place called um, ramnagar sugar mills and this is the, this was a place which had plenty of um, land around and the bhagirathi river flowed uh, next door the currents of the river was uh, were ideal where uh, uh, one could train the people where they would face the similar kind of currents when they go to bangladesh inside uh, for their task so that's how it came to be in um, the whole camp in pulasi and uh, so it proved that you know when there were about 400 plus people of trainees and uh, some instructors there still there were plenty of place to train people in uh, explosives and other things where you need a uh, lot of safety margins so uh, that's about the the um, uh, place um, lastly and uh, it was called c2p i mean like um, uh, camp uh, c for camp 2 is the service army navy and air force and p for classy so that's why it, it, it was called uh, camp c2p now coming to your second question um we did make a criteria of selection of these um, uh young boys and we had a bit a bit of a um uh, strict kind of uh, screening there uh, including the profiling of uh, volunteers so that they come from uh, every part of the uh, east pakistan land because if you travel from uh, east to west in uh, on that area uh, you would find that the uh, stature the um, facial uh, uh expression of fa- fa- facial uh, features and uh, their stature their uh, dialect of the language changes as as you move so it it was necessary to uh, pick up people from uh, those areas so that when uh, you uh, actually when they're launched they don't stand out like a sore thumb because they've got to live in that area for three four days and uh, mix get out and you know sort of uh, get gather their own intelligence and get out for the attack and things so uh they would be merging with the people now uh what, once this was said that uh, certain people were selected from the uh, um ab- other uh, camps and some refugee camps but uh, uh basically um, uh, these boys when they came into the camp they were as you said that they they were a different lot i mean there was a a little uh, sadness in their eyes there was a fire in the belly and uh, they were very keen to uh, start learning and uh, trying to get back to the uh, land where uh, they could take a bit of revenge from the people who were uh, dishing out these uh, terrible atrocities on their own people and their families and they had suffered so uh, in fact they were a lot which uh, needed a bit of motivation and um, a lot of uh, talking to them 
and which which was done by these eight submariners which had uh, come and they were they were taken as just instructors and they trained with them and they were a great motiv motivating factor for these boys uh, to show that you know these chaps have left their secure jobs come and uh, have come to fight for liberation of their own country and in the later part even um, colonel magus mani and his assistant wing commander konkar uh, used to come to the camp and talk to these boys, so their morale was kept up, and uh, that's how they, um, uh, you know, they um, dedicated themselves to the training and became such good um, waterborne savages. Fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? And you know, uh, Amish, you mentioned uh, uh, as an author uh, the significance of Plassey, Palashi, and and Sandeep's book. Actually, the prologue begins with with 1757 so he also as a historically inclined person sees this connect between the place where sort of you know uh, bengal losing its liberation now becoming the theater for it to become uh, a place from where it it, it gets sort of re-liberated and uh, uh, you know couples are mentioned about those eight escapees the mangro eight and i remember you being very fascinated when we spoke about it earlier I think one of the great things about this book uh, is that it is full of this very, very remarkable characters. Uh, uh, so much so that Sandeep has had to actually bring out a cast of characters in the book uh, at the beginning. But I remember saying that uh, if this book were to be made into a movie, it would have a star cast bigger than Sholi. <laughs> so so I, think, I think we should ask, I'll ask Sandeep, and then maybe you could pitch in. Uh, uh, Sandeep, wonderful cast of characters, beginning with your co-author, who was himself involved. And I, I can see that you have his photograph behind him. You remember that when we did the first book launch, we also had a missing author chair for him. Yes. Uh, a great person, remarkable person. Then on the other hand, there are people like Chiman Singh, who actually went behind enemy lines. Lots of these people uh, animate the book. And um, I think, you know, characters make a story. So perhaps you could you could sort of fill us on some of the remarkable characters that you encountered while writing this book. And how did it feel for you? Yep, uh, Shikant will... Uh, you know. Anip, sorry, sorry, sorry. If I, if I can just sorry. cut it, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, Commander Kapil sir was also there. Sandeep, after you're done with, uh, with your answer... Commander yeah. Kapil sir, if you could also speak, because even I, as an author, am fascinated by such characters. This is this is a book made for a for a movie. So uh, so characters like Admiral Nanda, Admiral Roy. I mean, if you can speak of them as well after Sandeep has has answered, what were they like? What is the camp atmosphere like? Uh, what is it that made this so uh, special and effective? It was a very small bunch of officers. They must have been truly truly special people. But sorry, Sandeep, sorry to cut it. Go ahead. Not at all, I'm sure. Well, uh, Shikant, to answer your question, it was fascinating characters and, you know, this maxim of, uh, uh, you know, uh, truth being stranger than fiction is what I actually encountered when I was writing this book. Because you had such larger than life characters like Admiral Nanda, you know, you have this uh, uh, a refugee from uh, West Pakistan who comes over here and uh, joins the Navy and wants to make a difference in the Navy, bullheaded man, larger than life. Uh, you know, he's the basically pushes the Navy into this war. And, uh, you know, there's, the jury is out on whether the Navy would actually have been part of the 1971 war had Admiral Nanda not been the chief at that time. And you have his uh, 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 DNI, his director of naval intelligence, uh, Captain Mir Roy, who's from East Pakistan. Uh, and, you know, he's from an aristocratic uh, landowning family there. But he transformed this into a very dark and, uh, you know, a very mission-oriented force, the naval intelligence. Then, uh, of course, you had my uh, my co-author, uh, Captain uh, MNR Samant, who's this very interesting, uh, 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 you know, a child of a, a war a hero who's uh, you know was captured by the Germans in the Second World War. In fact, his father was in a, a prisoner of war camp in uh, France uh, when he he was uh, growing up in the forties. He joined, uh, he was the last batch of um, uh, Indian naval officers to be commissioned in UK, which meant that he had been trained by the Royal Navy. And he was the first batch of uh, submariners who was actually trained by the Soviet Union. So he commanded our fourth uh, 
uh, Foxtrot class submarine, uh, the uh, uh, Kursura, and uh, uh, sorry, he commanded the. Uh, our, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, he commanded our fourth uh, Foxtrot class submarine, the Karanj. So he was a bridge between the Indian Navy, you know, that uh, Navy that was steeped in the Royal Navy ethos and training and uh, platforms that started moving towards the Soviet Union in the mid 1960s. Uh, and then, of course, you have these uh, incredible, uh, you know, bunch of naval divers like, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Lieutenant Samir Das, Commander Vijay Kapil, who've been trained the best of the best. They're, you know, they're uh, taught to think out of the box, be innovative. Uh, and this was, in effect, it was not only the, uh, uh, you know, the birth of the Indian Navy post-1971, but it, it was also the birth of the diving arm of the Indian Navy. Because within the Cinderella service, which is what the Indian Navy is known as, because it's the smallest of the three services. Within the Cinderella service also, you had the diving branch, which was the Cinderella uh, arm of the Cinderella service. So. 1971 kind of marked the birth and emergence of uh, this diving arm because the planners saw the kind of feats that they could perform in complete, uh, you know, completely disproportionate to their numbers. Fascinating. Commander Kapil, sir, if you could also speak of your experiences at the camp and the characters you met, it's, right. it's like starting a movie star cast. Yeah. Starting from Admiral Linda as... Um... Uh, Sandeep said he made a, he did a beautiful job of stitching the story together and analyzing the characters. In fact, he had nicknamed um, Admiral Nanda as the Emperor. <laughs> so, <laughs> as far as the Emperor was concerned, he was a brave man. I'm mean, like he always thought out of the box. He had a very fearless approach towards what he planned, and he threw all his weight, and his weight was plenty, um, but chief of naval staff, to do that, uh, that particular task uh, with the full earnestness. And that is why the, the prime examples of this uh, can be given that, you know, you, you've uh, heard about Oper um, uh, Operation Python and uh, Trident, um, completely innovative thinking, out of the box, um, the to uh, boat to the toad. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, Nobody expected that, including the Russians. Then uh, the, the, um, take the case of Vikrant, only in three boilers. The fourth one was limping. Um, mm -hmm. He said that, all right, you, re you repair it here in India, and whatever you can get, get it out, but Vikrant is going to go into war, which it did. And, and he had a knack of coming to the right place and wherever he wanted to trust areas, talk to the people, and... And, and the morale was up of everybody. Everybody gave the best. You know, his, he had that quality in him. So um, that was at Melinda. Even in our case, we had no limpid minds uh, when we started all this uh, foray into uh, uh, training these people. Um, we, uh, we had about um, only about two, two and a half months to produce mine. Olympic mine, which is a, a weapon of choice for uh, clandestine operations. Um, it was uh, Samir Das, who was a diver who was very sound. He's a, he was one of the best divers of the Navy. He was very sound in his uh, background knowledge of uh, the explosives and uh, diving, diving equipment. He was uh, mandated with the task of, uh, from the user's side for developing of this uh, Olympic mine. Uh, the Naval Armament Branch stood up to the task and uh, Commander Pintel was uh, the person who really did this job. And uh, within uh, about three months, they produced 300 mines. We, we ne never had any mines in, in India because they were imported till then. And that was also Second World War vintage from Britain. And if you go into the international market to buy uh, such things um, in bulk, the word gets around and, and the secrecy would have been lost. So all these um, aspects are very well known to, to uh, Captain Mickey Roy and uh, Admiral Nanda. And, and they, they produced, I mean, the third case, um, uh, second case in our scenario was um, conversion of these um, two flower, uh, flower class boats uh, from GRSE to Bangladesh in September 
Within a month, they were converted into uh, gunships uh, come mine lair. Now, um, uh, to, to a layman, um, it won't sound very complicated, but the thing is that, you know, when you take a ship which is not seaworthy, these boats were only made to operate in Hooghly River. Now, here you were converting into gunboats, so stability came in. Uh, each, each gun weighs about a ton plus, so two guns in the boat. Uh, then the mines and the mine rails, another ton, two tons, three tons added. And those uh, um, sitting on the upper deck means the stability problem. The, the center of gravity goes up, the metacentric height changes, and it can topple over like a, uh, it can just roll over. So uh, all these things, the warship um, overseeing team of Calcutta is to be given credit for this. The naval, uh, naval architect branch has got to be given credit to it. But they all stood up to the task because the old man wanted it. <laughs> so that was the kind of man he was. <laughs> then uh, coming down to the to to make it, he was a, he was a big picture man. All his um, um, smaller aspects had to be looked after by his staff. Here was the the um, DNI of his, who was uh, um, architect of this uh, operation and uh, who controlled these operations, planned these operations. He was a man who was a perfect spy master. I mean, that, that's a name again coined by Sandeep um, in course of discussion. He um, was uh, an, a man for details. He would work out nitty gritties. You had a meeting with him, he'll make down the notes. Uh, five years later, he'll coach you that you said so and so. So, uh, I mean, like he was that kind of a man. Um, so he, he was very thorough in what, what he did. And he was the kind of a chap who wouldn't trust his own shadow, <laughs> right? He wouldn't let his uh, left, left hand know what the right hand is doing. So that, that's how the secrecy of the whole project was maintained. He, he got people in the different places for doing the different job. And um, the, the, the um, code of conduct was that um, you just mind your own business. Don't ask questions from your friend or your colleague. <laughs> but nobody told, uh, told you the truth. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, Amesh, uh, Sandeep mentioned a delightful phrase. He called breadcrumbs left behind in Mickey Roy's book. Mm -hmm. You know, this book and the discussions that it has generated, I'm talking of Sandeep's book now, and the discussions it generated gives us enough breadcrumbs about so many trails that you can follow, you know, whether it's the conversion of those uh, flower class ships into gunboats, whether it is how those mines were manufactured. And each each hero or each character has a backstory, you know. Samanth has a backstory. Mickey Roy has a backstory. So many of them. I mean, uh, uh, we, we can't mention all of them. George Martis was there. Uh, Aku Roy, I think, uh, a great friend of uh, uh, Commander Kapil, one of the most colorful characters that you can get in the Navy. And Chiman Singh, you know, who, who actually went sympathetically with those people. Um, uh, Sub-Lieutenant Thakur was there. All these people, they were remarkable cast and crew of characters with backstories of their own. And I hope someday people will write about all of them. Uh, Sandeep, if I can come to you, because your book is full of really uh, intriguing uh, details, like how radio songs were used to, uh, to communicate uh, coded uh, messages uh, uh, to, uh, to the undercover officers working. Uh, in Bangladesh and in uh, and in India, and uh, very hilariously, even condoms <laughs> had a role to play, <laughs> which which one did not think was possible. So, do you want to explain uh, these two uh, things? Yeah, sure, Ramesh. In fact, uh, the radio signals that you mentioned uh, were uh, used in the Second World War by the Allied forces to communicate with uh, the huh? resistance forces in occupied Nazi-occupied Europe. And it so happens that the person who wrote the uh, Mukti Bahini training paper was uh, a, a General Inder Gill, another remarkable character. Uh, you know, he was the director of military operations in 71 war. He was part of the special operations executive in the Second World War. He was an officer, he was a sapper. He, was, he operated behind uh, enemy lines with the Greek partisans. 
exactly like you saw in the guns of navarone for instance mm, okay. now so that explains how a lot of the second world war you know tactics were used by us because in effect this was literally the last war of the second world war because a lot of the veterans that you had in uh, 71 had actually uh, seen action in the second world war and uh, general gill was one of them now uh, the other point of course being that uh, the navy's role in the 71 war as commander kapil so beautifully brought out is that they never took no for an answer you know they would never say that we are not prepared for this or we are not prepared for that we don't have gunboats we uh, i mean let, let's look at the navy when the war began they didn't have missile boats that had the range to go to karachi and back so they said okay fine uh, let's tow them to karachi and then launch the missiles uh, as kamara kapil said the vikrant had a crack in its boiler they said fix the crack let's go with what we have the navy didn't have a special forces unit like they have today the marine commando uh, unit they said let's go with the diving branch let's use them to uh, train these uh, mukti bahini uh, uh, saboteurs and then finally they said they had no limpet mines as kamara kapil again said that the drdo produced a record number of limpet mines in a record uh, period of time and as these limpet right, sorry. Sandeep, sorry to cut in just for the uh, just for the benefit of audiences who may not know if you can explain what limpet mines is so i was just <laughs> yeah i mean so a limpet mine is essentially uh, it's something like half a football and it's filled with about 4 kg of high explosive and it's got magnetized uh, uh, you know it's got magnets on the back uh, and it fits uh, onto the uh, you know on the metal surfaces of uh, ships and these are typically planted by frogmen or uh, free swimmers uh, free swimmers of the kind that uh, commander kapil had trained and these limpet mines were what the uh, mukti bahini naval unit used to blast ships which meant that they uh, you know they had a certain number of mines that they could plant on these ships and they would uh, explode them and the ship would sink or be disabled or be completely crippled this is what they did they used hundreds of these limpet mines Uh, and now it so happened that when they were improvising these mines like the diario uh, made them they discovered that they didn't have a timer uh, of the uh, of the correct uh, you know uh, uh, time that that would uh, cause the limpet mine to explode in a certain amount of time so that the diver was safe and he didn't dive with his own uh, weapon so that is when they improvised this uh, condom they said look they had a soluble plug on the limpet mine a soluble plug is Uh, something like a candle but it kind of melts when it's exposed to water and when uh, the plug completely dissolves a firing sequence is complete and the mine blows off destroys a uh, uh, the side of the ship so they said we need to protect this uh, soluble plug when it's in water and that's when someone came up with this bright idea to use a condom to roll a condom around that soluble plug so that when this swimmer sabotier is swimming in the water with the limpet mine uh, he, they actually swam back uh, you know they did a back stroke they had these flippers they would swim on their backs with the mine on their chest they would swim to the ship uh, you know touch the ship plant the limpet mine on the side of the ship and then swim away to take off the condom and then swim away to safety and once that condom was taken off of course the plug was exposed to the water it was it was indian jugaad at its finest <laughs> this is like uh, you know all the stuff that we so take for granted now about how you know we are so resourceful and all that it came into complete play in the 1971 war starting from missile boats to aircraft carriers to uh, you know limpet mines and finally even to the soluble plug of the limpet mines fantastic you know, yeah. sandeep if i can just so if i can just add you know it takes it takes someone who really knows his stuff to take complicated things that most civilians would not know and explain it in a way that we can actually understand what happened uh sandeep you have that rare skill man so thank you thank you your book is so fantastic <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is it is you know it's it's uh, amish it's unputdownable yeah. you know so so that's that's uh, a remarkable quality about this book you actually keep turning turning you know you keep turning the pages and again he is thrown more bread crumbs you know uh, general inder gill for example is another great story mm-hmm. the fact that navy did not you know accept no for an answer and did lots of things uh, and each of these is is a story in itself uh, waiting to be written and one of these great stories which i am going to ask uh, commander kapil is about force alpha 
now you know uh, i must tell our uh, 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 listeners having done all that this force could have done by way of the clandestine operations between august to sort of december when they had sunk enough a record amount of shipping and hit the maritime jugular as sandeep says it didn't stop this uh, this intrepid bunch of people what they did they assembled four ships and when the war started with commander samant in lead all of them actually did a raid into east pakistan now remember this is daring because even the karachi attack was off karachi in this case they actually went into east pakistan uh, with with uh, through the riverine terrain which was extremely treacherous for navigation and four ships uh, only one panvel which was a naval ship one chitrangada a bsf and two two uh, grsc boats that that commander kapil talked about and which sandeep calls them as a flower class padman palash so this tiny bunch of four ships went in and caused sort of mayhem there uh, it was daring more importantly uh, there was certain drama in that and that drama what happened how people were rescued uh, how did the whole thing transpire force alpha and its story i want to ask commander kapil and break it down for our listeners and tell us what happened sir uh, yes uh, shrikant this um, force alpha basically it was uh, the operation undertaken by this group of captain samant uh, after the war broke out the other operations were before the war so uh, in this operation of course as you said that uh, we went behind the lines these uh, two flock uh, class boats um, commanded by two uh, daring indian naval officers crew being the bangladeshi deserters from the ships in the pakistani navy uh, so it was only the officers which were indian and um, i'll come uh, come to their exploits earlier after i explain about the force alpha these two boats and chitranga also um, uh, which was loaned by bsf mm -hmm. and um, under the command of a naval officer Kumar, uh, lieutenant Mohan Mukherjee, but since it it didn't have the speed, um, it had to be left behind, and um, only three ships went up the Pusa River. Up to Chalna, there was no problem. Thereafter, um, um, in the morning of I think it was ninth um, Sandeep, if you remember the date, it was the ninth yeah. of uh, December. December. Um, when we when we crossed in um, the the uh, towards khulna uh, we saw three aircrafts in the sky and suddenly one of the aircrafts came down for the recce and we had our uh, recognition signals up on the ships because uh, this kind of a thing was thought because it was a war and we were going into the territory where air force was flying there was an army uh, which was um, present there they were they were fighting on the 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 jessor sector maybe the, the, these are the naval ships uh, under the command of the naval ship and the two mukti bahini boats as we call mm -hmm. them so these recognition signals were pro uh, probably missed or the probably the uh, leader did not uh, notice it because uh, i can understand they've got a split second Uh, to pass over the boats and off they went. Uh, we recognize these aircrafts as uh, NATs, so our own air force. So um, there was not much of reaction, and um, we didn't come to uh, sort of uh, action stations against these aircrafts, even though we were actually at, at, at action stations because there was firing from uh, both both the uh, banks of Pusar River onto the ships because they they. on the, um, uh, particularly the um, um, western bank which was well fortified in the eastern bank it was not that much fortified so uh, we were firing i mean the ships were firing and then uh, suddenly all these three aircrafts uh, swooped down us and it it became a very nasty blue and blue situations now 
for, for, for the viewers who don't know what Blue and Blue is, it, Blue and Blue is the um, incident when uh, the friendly force attacks the friendly force. I mean, that's the same force. So um, it is a confusion. There's a, con a state of confusion. So um, I, when the first boat was taken, it was uh, Padma, commanded by um, Lieutenant Mittar. Uh, they got him completely bang on on the bridge. And next to the bridge was the uh, ammunition for the 4060. So the sympathetic detonation, there was a big explosion and uh, a lot of people were injured, including Chiman Singh, very seriously, uh, Lieutenant Natu, who was uh, on board, who was the support staff for these two, um, Padma and Palash, these two uh, Muktivani boats. And um, Lieutenant Mitter himself, but some of the Muktivani lost their life also in that. So the, these three people jumped off and went to swam to the west bank of the river, where they were captured later and um, were prisoners of war. And um, the, uh, the Chiman Singh and uh, uh, Natu were very, very seriously injured. Now, coming to the second boat, Palash, it was the second boat which was taken by the second aircraft because we were going in the formation with uh, um, the Panwell, Palash, and Padma. So second boat was taken by the second aircraft where I was present and commanding officer was uh, left commander Roy Chaudhary. Now, um, this boat, the, the rocket caught us on the engine room and the engine room caught fire and um, the dump, they, these were small boats, the ammunition dump was there only, the, um, uh, the, it was stacked there. So eventually it also uh, sort of caught, uh, this, uh, caught fire with the sympathetic detonation. Um, this boat, Rod Chaudhary, beached it on the uh, east bank of Pusar River going up to Kulna. And um, most of the people, the Bangladeshi crew, were told to abandon. They abandoned, everybody jumped in the water. Basically, uh, it's the um, water which is safer when the aircraft are chasing you and coming back for the staff and run. Uh, it's a horrific situation, but uh, uh, needs to be experienced, I guess, to know how bad it is. So, um, from there, one had to make to um, uh, on the on the shore where uh, Lieutenant Commander Roy Chaudhary was in no condition to uh, uh, to 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 um, swim or go in the water. So I stuck on with him, and thereafter we commanded the boat and went. And they, but um, fortunately for us, um, Ines Panwell did not get um, hit because it started taking away a waiting action. There was a couple of seconds uh, reaction time. And uh, rockets just missed them. And, um, and the boat went up the river and, uh, you know, sort of they opened fire um, at the aircraft so that their strafing runs also were a little disturbed and uh, the, the ACAT fire comes on. The, the aircraft, really, their aim, aims also uh, waver a bit. So um, it was still afloat and undamaged. So they were the ones who picked up the survivors and we were, uh, you know, the pe people who were hit and who were rescued by the boat. We were really thankful that, you know, one boat was really intact and uh, um, uh, one could be picked up. So that, that was the saga of this place. Thereafter, pa Panwell did a lot of um, uh, devastation on um, Kulna Harbor, where the Kulna shipyard is there, or, um, uh, pumped in a lot of uh, 40, 60 shells there. Uh, there were there were um, other installations, and there were I think the central jail is nearby. So it it was uh, one of those uh, destructive uh, raids, because uh, I believe the uh, army was uh, having a very um, tough opposition from the uh, uh, brigade at Jasor. So that's why these boats were sent for the destructive raids, so that we can so soften them up and some of their uh, uh, some of their um, efforts could uh, would be diverted towards this, and uh, army have will have that much uh, kind of advantage 
over the enemy. So anyway, after picking up this, we came back and the next day we um, offloaded the um, couple of uh, BSF guys were dead and um, they, they were handed over to the uh, BSF formation. And um, we came back to Hasnabad the next day and um, the injured were picked up and uh, taken. But before that, I'd, I'd all, uh, before I finish, I'd also like to say, um, uh, talk about the exploits of uh, uh, Left Mondo Roy Chaudhary and uh, Left Mittal. The um, gunboats' first foray into the um, uh, clandestine um, operations was they, these were the two brave officers who were the only ones who went behind the enemy lines before the war was declared. They went and laid mines, ship, um, anti shipping mines. These are big mines weighing about 300, 400 kgs, and uh, they were carrying four of them. They laid uh, they went into Posa River through uh, via Sandheads. One of the Indian naval ships called Kiltan, Petia class, escorted, uh, escorted them up to the uh, um, uh, uh, exclusive economic zone um, and, and stayed back there. So, um, not exclusive, uh, to the territorial waters. And um, it stayed back there, but these two boats went in. And these bo two boats, the problem was that these uh, were the um, um, boats for the um, Calcutta Port Trust as service boats and the, the supply boats and things. So they didn't have any radar. They didn't have any uh, um, proper echo sounder. They didn't have communication sets. They didn't have a gyro compass. So it was a magnetic compass with them, which was um, not even swung. So uh, you can imagine, and they went middle of the night uh, into Pusar River, laid these mines very accurately um, in the entrance between the boys, and they, they got immediate dividend uh, the next day when two ships blew, uh, uh, blew off. And uh, I think um, one of their Shanghai-class boats was sent to investigate. I believe it was Rajshahi. Uh, is it correct, um, uh, Sandeep? Was it Rajshahi or uh, no? Someone? No, it wasn't uh, Rajshahi. It was another one, but it, it was another a one. patrol boat. Yeah, that it was... Due to smithereens yeah. there, yes. and the next day the port of Khulna was declared uh, closed for all marine uh, marine traffic. So you can imagine uh, the um, uh, devastation earlier in in, in uh, August in uh, Chittagong. It was limping, and here the other port was completely shut down. And that was middle of November, 12, 13 of November. So it, uh, the, the technical advantage they got was um, uh, pretty, pretty good. And, and these, these were the um, uh, two dashing commanding officers who came back and uh, then went and uh, joined Force Alpha thereafter during the war. So uh, if, I may, if I may just ask uh, one question of the officers in that first port who came under uh, friendly fire. Did we have any fatalities? Did they all survive? Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, none of the Indians. Um, we, we, uh, me, Chaman Singh, and a um, couple of Indian uh, uh, sailors did, uh, officers did, like uh, the support staff of these boats, um, did join uh, during this raid. But uh, fortunately for us, for us uh, there was no casualties. No casualties of uh, Bangladesh. In fact, um, it's very interesting in Palash, the boat where I was in, commanded by Lieutenant Roy Chaudhary. Uh, the engineer officer was called uh, Raul Amin, uh, the, the ERA. <laughs> he was awarded the uh, uh, equivalent of PVC called Bir Shreshto by the um, uh, the Bangladesh government. Okay. Okay. But fatalities were there in, in the, the Mukti Bahini crew. You know, Amish, I, uh, the, the, the very fascinating part about this uh, first Alpha raid, one, of course, it happens during the war, in the middle of war, when, when all gloves are off, so to say, mm -hmm. as far as um, engagement is concerned. Um, second is, as he brought out, as Commander Kapil brought out, there was equal or more Mukti Bahini participation, mm -hmm. and many of them were awarded uh, you know, uh, uh, gallantry awards by their country, the highest gallantry award for their participation in this. In these uh, I 
yeah can i just add one thing from a popular culture thing because uh, two of the boats are named after flowers and i think call them flower power so there's a very famous dialogue these days which i must say pushpa naam sunke flower samjhe kya fire hai mein jhukega nahi maybe they have they have borrowed it from here because uh, padma and palash actually were fire power then and the way i think what commander kapil talks about the bravery and uh, laying mines i think sandeep calls it the turtles hatching or something like that in his book but you yeah. know uh, uh, to explain uh, to explain what um, as you say amish to make it little easy for the listeners one is uh, the anti ship mines are very much different from the limpet mines mm-hmm. limpet mines are like underwater bomb small half a football small. size as sandeep said whereas these are huge and laid Uh, in in the navigation channels of rivers and all where ships pass, so that the ships can sort of be hit by that. No, I have a, requires... I have a small model of the uh, anti ship mine uh, in my hand. Uh, now the actual mine is about seven feet long, wow. and it's filled with explosive. So this is a Mark Seven anti ship mine, and I'll give you another example of Indian naval jugad. This was this mine was meant for the Alize aircraft, which was flying off the Vikrant. Okay. now they modified the flower class to carry four of these mines air drop uh-huh. air drop mines which were modified onto a ship so that they could float so that they could uh, they could be launched from a ship launched from a ship okay so yeah so they, they, your, they just yeah. sit on the so, bottom yeah so what uh, how the aircraft drops it is it would drop like that yes. it had a parachute at the end it would uh-huh. go and sit on the bottom and then wait for a ship to pass now this is it's massive it's like uh, almost weighs half a ton it's filled with high explosive and there's a ship count mechanism here there is it's a it's a uh, it's a created from an actual mine model that was gifted by the indian navy to the bangladesh navy last year and uh, like i said this is almost 7 feet long and these uh, four of these mines were on the flower class boats so what you have is like a water taxi these flower class boats were like water taxis used to move around kolkata port and overnight they were converted into gunboats with these two small bofors guns and four of these mine layer uh, you know these uh, anti ship mines taken from aircraft and fitted on that so it was like i said amish mean, this is all great naval jugad you know they never took no for an answer they improvised went on the fly they created uh, you know warships out of uh, petrol boats it's like almost creating uh, you know armored personal carriers out of taxis you know stuff like that <laughs> yeah, what did is to indian navy uh, at that time and... yes sir go yeah. ahead sir yeah ahead, in fact indian navy at that time hardly had any ship laid mines yes we, we didn't have any mine there so it's a, a innovation as you, as sandeep said that aircraft mine, laid mines were used here and um so, It, it, and um, fortunately every every mine all all the explosives worked 100% mm. we have had soft to the naval armament um, branch who who um, serviced them and put them left in chitre um, uh, aeronautical uh, armament officer was uh, one to be credited for that mm. because he was trained in france and he was called and he he sat down diligently and worked on these mines and you know sort of made them operational and um you know it, it did work it did work pretty, pretty well fascinating fascinating you know amish uh since we're talking about this force alpha we we got someone who was a participant in that trade and we'll bring him up shortly but very briefly to explain i think uh, what what commander kapil said blue on blue is inadvertently being hit in the heat of war by your own force uh, it happens sometimes and sympathetic detonation that he mentioned is when a small fire uh, leads uh, because of explosives or other things in vicinity to a much bigger fire with catastrophic consequences i mean there's nothing very sympathetic about sympathetic detonation <laughs> it is it is catastrophic but i just, just thought there is that nothing friendly about friendly fire friendly <laughs> fire <laughs> no but uh, to go the, the fog of war i guess yeah the fog of war yeah. and one person who was involved in yeah. this was commander ashok kumar who was on ins panvel and as commander kapil brought out panvel was the last man standing and he had a tough job he had to 
take survivors out of the river, face the Razakars and the other hostile enemy fire, and then he gave it back full tilt. And the man who fired from that gun was Commander Ashok Kumar Veer Chakra. Uh, and we are so, so lucky to have a sound bite from him. He's one of the important participants in the war. And he'll also tell us what happened in Force Alpha. Uh, over to Commander Ashok Kumar. Let's hear it. Sir, can you describe your action on INS Panvel that day in the middle of Rupsa River when the pro Pakistani militia men? Uh, attack from the bunkers and started firing. Uh, on that day, 10th December 1971, uh, uh, this uh, we were the, the first one mm. to open the fire mm. on the uh, Pakistanis or home chairman who were there in the Khulna Harbor protecting mm. beach. Mm. Firstly, they were taken by surprise, total surprise was given to them. That broad daylight, mm. one ship is coming in their uh, area, mm. and uh, they first we thought it was a Pakistani ship, mm. but when we started firing, mm. then they realized that this is the Indian vessel, and they opened fire from their bunkers. Okay. Now we uh, we were firing from our uh, uh, 40, 60 buffer gun. One was on the forward of the vessel, mm. minus Panvel, and the other was on the off ah. outside. And we are also firing from the small arms from the post bridge of the uh, vessel mm. ship. Now, this, uh, our 4060, we had uh, uh, no protection for the crew. Mm. Mm. There was no nothing, any structure to protect the crew. We were firing from the, uh, both the guns, mm. and uh, they were told to continue firing till the ammunition, whatever we have brought it on deck, mm. almost 600 rounds, mm. is over. Mm. Now, when you open fire, they had opened fire from the from the bunkers, mm. and uh, they were firing from this uh, 9mm finger or SLR. Mm. Now, somehow or other, the topography, mm. topography of that area, the Kuruna Harbor, when we were uh, uh, moving down the stream, mm. uh, the topography was such mm. when they were firing from the bunkers, mm. the bullets either hit the uh, bank. Okay. And then hit the ship side, mm. superstructure, because our uh, freeboard to have a very uh, low. Okay. So it used to go and hit the uh, ship side, mm. forward ship side, and the ball uh, uh, that was hitting was there, mm. which we noticed after the war was over and checked up to our ship's conditions. Now, when the moment they raised a bit uh, parallel of their uh, uh, guns, mm. It used to go over the head of our crew. Okay. So this is how they we were protected yeah. from the any attack from the uh, 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 being hit by the barracks, uh, bunkers. Mm -hmm. Our crew brought the uh, entire Kulna Harbor, whatever was the office, drag off, shifts in, drag off, shifts in uh, the park. They were told that without any further order. Mm. Waiting for the further order. Once the fire is open, mm. to continue firing, and we kept on continuing firing on the Kulna Harbor. Mm. Uh, all the establishment, whatever was there, mm. and we kept on moving down the stream of the Rupsa River. Mm. Mm. Now, after the it was, it took about almost uh, half an hour. Mm. The entire mm. operation was over in half an hour, okay. and the uh, distance between my ship. And the bunkers mm. were uh, uh, less than I think I think it was less than 60 meters. So one way you can say it is hand to hand fight. In every terminology, mm. it is hand to hand fight mm. because the distance was so less. Mm. In the arm, and uh, army is even more physically involved. Mm. 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 But in naval term, I think it is uh, 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 hand to hand fight because the distance was very less. So that is how we uh, kept on firing, and we fired almost to 600 rounds in the mm. uh, found of ships mm. and brought extensive damage mm. to the Kulna Station, Kulna Harbor Station. Mm. So now you said that uh, they are firing hit on the ship side, or they went above the crew mm. before opening fire. Did you? Did you or the crew ever realize that what if the, their firing hit us? Because at that time you had no crew when they opened fire. 
तो तब क्या होता सर नहीं दैट इज द टाइम नो वी न्यू देर इज नो प्रोटेक्शन फॉर दवर क्रू इफ एनी वन ऑफ द क्रू आर हिट वी हैड नो रिप्लेसमेंट फॉर दैट and the uh, the uh, um, other crew mm. has to manage loaded and fire it mm. so this we knew mm. but in such situation the purpose of the mission is more important than the personal safety of the crew okay so we uh, just regarding the complete personal safety mm. of the crew mm. and the persons on the bridge open bridge because mm. we were on the open bridge mm. and there were two bridges One is closed bridge, okay. another yes. is open bridge. So we knew that there is no protection. Mm. But then, uh, as they said, the firing from the bunkers mm. could not hit us. They hit at least one uh, um, uh, bridge. The chief quartermaster was hit in the stomach. Okay. I was firing from the closed bridge, mm. but I was hit. By a nine mm machine gun bullet, okay. which came piercing the super structure, the super structure of the uh, bridge, closed bridge, and came and hit me on my left side with the wheels. It was this, and I was injured, but I still continued firing from the closed bridge. Okay. And the crew uh, was told again, "Do not wait for any uh, further order, or anything. You continue firing." Okay. So, so how long did you fire after being? We fired after injury till we completed the entire uh, area of the uh, hard kulna harbor. Mm-hmm. When we were just outside, because there was no any thing to fire upon. Mm-hmm. That is the time we stopped firing. Okay. And when we uh, stopped firing and counted the how many shells have been fired, it was almost six hundred shells. Mm-hmm. And then six hundred shells, which we had, some of them must have gone overboard also in the water. But uh, they all littered the entire deck was littered with the shells, okay. and it is really a, a, I mean I, I, after that I realized the how the shells did not go overboard all the hmm. because there was a combing all around the uh, upper deck of the vessel. Okay. So the shell after firing is just being ejected. Hmm. They used to come and hit the combing and then okay. uh, 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 drop on the deck of the vessel. So this was six hundred shells we had fired. And the my gun, both the guns, forward and aft, was so barrels were so heated up, mm. so so hot mm. that you standing three feet away from them you can feel the heat. Mm. And I uh, give credit to the God or maintenance of our uh, guns that not a single round misfired during this uh, half an hour operations and firing of six hundred rounds. it was so uh, wonderful listening to uh, commander ashok kumar veer chakra wadi and uh, genuine indian hero uh, thank you so much sir for your uh, words sandeep if i can come to you there are many uh, you know inspiring moments in the book uh, books that give us uh, goosebumps uh, but uh, the escape of the mangro eight uh, from europe uh, take us through that uh, you know the uh, the drama behind it and how critical it was for what unfolded well amish uh, the mangro uh, was the pakistani naval submarine uh, that was uh, bought from france there were three submarines this was the third and the last one that had finished its trials uh, its builder trials and it had it was heading towards pakistan to join the pakistan navy now it so happened that among the uh, crew were a few bengali uh, uh, sailors and who were very disturbed with what was going on back home because they were seeing uh, you know uh, uh, bbc radio broadcasts about the violence the genocide which had just started in east pakistan uh, operation searchlight in march of uh, 1971 so the eight of them decided to make a break for it they said they are not going to be part of this uh, uh, you know a genocidal force and they decided to mutiny and escape from pakistan uh, from the um, uh, pakistani submarine that was berthed in france at that time and go back to india to fight for uh, the liberation of bangladesh and it so happened that they landed up in spain they had a uh, they literally chased all across europe trying to find a way to get to india and the indian high commission and the indian embassy and they finally landed up in madrid uh, to the uh, indian embassy there and they were helped by a very resourceful uh, foreign uh, uh, service officer who uh, checked with uh, delhi who said 
that listen, give them false papers, bring them back home. And that's how they were kind of, uh, you know, these eight men led by a very resourceful uh, young naval sailor, uh, Commodore A.W. Chaudhary. Of course, he was uh, a, a young sailor at that time. And he was the mastermind of this uh, mutiny on board the Mangro. He was the one who kind of motivated these uh, seven other sailors to, uh, you know, uh, desert their ships and their stations and to fight for uh, the liberation of Bangladesh. And now these eight... Uh, Crew, when they came, they landed in New Delhi in complete secrecy. They're brought in by RNAW and uh, they're handed over to naval intelligence, obviously, because uh, they saw that uh, the Navy could use their services. And that's when the Navy kind of figured that they could use these, uh, uh, these deserters, these uh, 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 Pakistan naval sailors to set up this the core of what they had been planning, which was this Naval Commando Operations X. And four of these uh, uh, Mangro sailors went on to lead task uh, forces into uh, East Pakistan on the 16th of August, 1971, which is possibly one of the largest special forces operations ever carried out by any Indian service, uh, namely the Indian Navy, where on one night you had something like 200 combat swimmers of the Mukti Bayani, led by these four uh, uh, sailors from the Mangro, who simultaneously attacked the ports of Chalna Mongla, uh, Narayan Ganj, uh, and uh, Chittagong. And, uh, uh, you know, they attacked something like 20 ships in the span of a few hours of one night. And the kind of chaos that they created, and this is the kind, we talk about surgical strikes now, this was a perfect surgical strike, then a swarming attack using hundreds of these swimmers, perfectly coordinating their attack. And this is where the Mangro 8 actually proved their worth to this operation. And incidentally, Amish, I must tell you that the, when the swimmers, when, when the Mangro, uh, the deserters were first brought to Delhi, uh, the naval intelligence first decided to train them in uh, the Yamuna River for uh, their, you know. So, and then I think uh, the better sense prevailed. They realized that this is too uh, too much in the open. And that's that's when Lieutenant Kapil, then Lieutenant Kapil entered the scene and chose this uh, very in, inconspicuous uh, site, called, which was the uh, the battleground of uh, Plasse. So uh, that's okay. where, uh, the, you know, to answer your question, that is how the uh, these these very eight very brave men from uh, East Pakistan and later Bangladesh. They they form the core of uh, you know this naval commando operations X, and they form the leaders. And they later rose to be. Uh, you know, officers, they uh, became high, uh, you know, they rose in through the Bangladesh Navy. They formed the first few officers of the Bangladesh Navy. Remarkable stories, great men, uh, you know, just like, you know, exactly what the 71 war was all about. It was the liberation war. And these were the heroes of that war. You know, uh, Amish, I think Kapil sir could write a book or an article saying from Yamuna to Bhagirathi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know the fascinating thing that sandeep brings out and i think we must we must focus and underscore this that we talk of jointmanship amongst our armed forces but this was as much jointmanship between yeah, india and bangladesh between yes. the mukti Bahini, the mukti jodhas the water wing yeah. at every stage the mangro eight were critical in setting up the camp as commander kapil said they motivated those 400 plus people uh, I think, Sandeep, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they were also used to identify the Ghazi when, when she sank. That's uh, correct. You know, yes. so, so they, and then they were a part of the force Alpha. You know, many of them gave their lives. Uh, many of them became senior officers. Indian troops then went to clear the mines after the war. Indian officers were posted into the Bangladesh Navy to sort of, uh, you know, uh, bring it up. Through all these stages, this was a combined operation and it wouldn't have been possible without effective Bangladesh participation. So I want to ask, you know, maybe the last question before we let in the audience. I want to ask Commander Kapil, sir, uh, you, it's, it's unfair to ask what's your favorite movement, but, but I, I see that probably there would be some nostalgia in how it all ended and all of you were together in, uh, you know, in Dhaka with uh, uh, Mukti Jodha. So, can you just take us what was your favorite moment of all this, and how it was critical having uh, the Bangladeshis on board? 
Um, it's very difficult to point out what the favorite uh, moment was because uh, there was none um, during the training. You didn't have time to breathe, um, and, and and the whole um, six, seven, eight months, almost nine months, which I spent far from my hospitalization, were were cramped up with, with nothing to think about. I'm like you know just uh, busy. So, but um, you know uh, the the uh, Participation of these Bangladeshis, um, the the um, Bengalis of East Pakistan, Bengali origin people, was phenomenal. I mean, like these uh, eight submariners, of course, uh, came in. They were uh, trained in the Pakistan Navy. They found um, they, they 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 were disciplined. So so they were much easier to handle, and you know they 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 could pass on to the the young boys what the correct um, um, a, a kind of behavior is how uh, they should be um, uh, sort of asking for things or not asking for things, and what they're getting is how 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 much better it was when they, they, than the Pakistani armed forces do get. What kind of behaviors they do get from their um, um, hierarchy. Here um, in in our camp, there was. Uh, no discrimination at all between uh, uh, the origin of the people or um, whether they were sailors or they were officers. Uh, you know, the Martis, um, uh, Martis, um, Samir Das, me, we all come from the diving branch where we, we mesh with the sailors because when we got to do a job, we'd be, do the job together. So and when we are doing the job, we are underwater, there's no officer, there's no sailor. We are divers. That's it. That's our identity, and and that's how we train these boys. There were there were no identity except that they are the the, the underwater saboteurs, and they're going to work together, and they were, were going to work for the cause, which is um, which they really have come for, and which they did produce at the end of it. Uh, so Amit, should we open to yes. audience interaction now? Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. There, there are loads uh, of questions and comments coming as you guys can can clearly see. Uh, many of yeah. them are comments, but uh, you know some questions coming in as well. Shika, over to you. you wanna... Yeah, I, I see. Interestingly, there's there's a British Army officer, Captain uh, Munish Chavan, I think, who's got a question uh, for our panelists. Can we can we have him up and and have him ask the question? Hey, my name is Manish Johan. I'm a uh, training surgeon in the British Army. Uh, thank you for the very informative talk today. It's been uh, great listening to some of the history. Uh, sorry I couldn't join in, in the beginning, but I, whatever I heard is, is, sounds amazing. I probably missed out on the beginning part of it. Uh, my question to the panel, if that's okay. Thank you for letting me ask a question to, to start with. So the question is, uh, with the riverine nature of uh, geography, uh, strong tidal flows um, and shallow sand, uh, sand banks, how difficult were the diving operations and the beaching and navigation navigating operations? Thank you. Sir, I, I think this is for you, sir, Kapil, sir. How difficult was the diving and beaching and navigation operations in the river in Peren? You could go ahead and Sandeep could add a bit, sir. Yes. Um, frankly, there was um, a beaching operations took place after the, the, the war was when it, when it, in its... Uh, um, I think uh, fifth or sixth day when uh, uh, the beaching operations were supposed to have been uh, done in Cox's Bazaar. The um, uh, Lieutenant Martis, who was the OIC of the camp, uh, Sub Lieutenant uh, Thakur, um, MS Gupta, one of the very experienced diving sailors, clearance divers, and uh, Elsing and a couple of more were uh, pulled out of the camp and uh, this effort in. Uh, somewhere in um, mid of November and put on the Eastern Fleet. And um, Left Commander Martis carried out the beach reconnaissance for the, uh, for the landing operations. And beach reconnaissance basically is an operation where you, uh, when, when the ships are there and you reach the shallow waters, thereafter you um, dive and see where the sandbars are, if there are any sandbars, and if the beach, when the beach really starts. So if there's a sandbar in between, uh, it may be a false kind of a sh uh, shallow water and uh, the landing ship 
should not uh, open the holes and you know uh, sort of take that route. They must take the uh, diversionary route, go to the beach itself, and then open the hole and uh, for the people to uh, uh, jump out and go to the, uh, for the beaching operations. So here on uh, the the water, I, I really wouldn't know what the waters were like, but uh, um, if um, uh, Chittagong Harbor and, and our harbors are any indications uh, to this underwater conditions, the visibility is almost nil, and you got to, you got to do the things with the feel, and um, you got you got to uh, um, establish where really the shallow water do do start, and also while doing so, you also um, uh, mark out a passage for the ship that there are no mines there. And the the passage will be safe for the things uh, for for the landing ships to go there. You know, Sandeep, you'd like to add a bit about the navigation, uh, or particularly of the force alpha and those treacherous waters. You mentioned they used army maps instead of navy charts, so you could add a bit bit uh, in. Yeah, yeah, in sure. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much for the question, Manish, and. Uh, to answer very briefly, the Bangladesh, as you know, is a riverine country. I mean, it's the you know confluence of two gigantic rivers. It's one of the largest deltas in the world. Uh, they completely bisect that country into. It's almost like looking at a fishing net in certain parts of the country. You know, it's like so many waterways and uh, canals and uh, you know interconnected uh, waterways. All of that, which were used to great advantage by the Indian Navy in '71. Uh, the first aspect, of course, we, which we discussed under Operation X, where they identified the uh, areas where they could attack shipping. A lot of this shipping that they attacked using these surface swimmers and subortiers were in the riverine areas. Like most of the ports in uh, then East Pakistan were all in the were all riverine ports, including Chittagong, and they were all in rivers. And uh, so that's where they launched their uh, swimmers. Uh, that presented you know problems of of their own because like we mentioned earlier the soluble plugs for instance had been designed for seawater but you know in fresh water they behave differently so little things like that and uh, it, it it really helped that you had people of a very high caliber very professional uh, naval uh, officers who had studied this terrain very well they planned their operations accordingly uh, the best example being uh, then captain Mickey Roy, uh, you know, who uh, did a very fine job assessing what they needed to paralyze these waterways of East Pakistan to completely choke all the avenues that the Pakistan army would use to, you know, uh, you know, uh, build up their stocks of ammunition and fuel and uh, uh, personnel, and which is what naval warfare ultimately is all about. It's about influencing the course of the land battle. So in, in a sense, this operation is so unique because you had the Indian Navy fighting, not the Pakistan Navy, but it was actually fighting the Pakistan Army in East Pakistan that was relying on the seaways and the waterways to kind of uh, replenish their war machine. So in a, in a sense, this was the ultimate example of how a Navy could influence uh, the course of the land battle. So for every ship that they targeted, that had uh, you know ammunition and fuel it meant that the pakistan military had that much less fuel to fight the indian army when it invaded when it attacked in december it had fewer bullets to shoot at them because their ships had been sunk all of those things came out so beautifully uh, you know in this joint operation which which had the navy working with the army and indeed the air force what we call joint friendship so uh, to yeah, cut a long uh, answer short. Uh, this this was a perfect example of what we say jointmanship. And secondly, it's a complete. Um, uh, it was a complete success because of the way they studied the terrain of uh, East Pakistan, this riverine terrain, and uh, which uh, the the force alpha raid that we mentioned earlier is the Indian Navy's only riverine gunboat raid. So they've never operated in uh, gunboats in riverine, uh, uh, you know, in rivers, so to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you. Yeah, thank you very much for the detailed answer. It's very uh, informative. And very interesting to hear about uh, how they did the homework before they went in and how it influenced the, the whole war. Really, yeah, that's that's great to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, Shikant, with your permission, if I may just uh, cut in with a question. We have a very uh, we have a video recording. A question from uh, Humphrey Oxley. 
uh, an author and uh, the former BBC Asia correspondent. Uh, if you could hear, have uh, that question put up, please. This war happened in 1971. And at that time, Bangladesh was one of the poorest parts of the subcontinent. Uh, 50 years on, it's done better than a lot of its neighbors and counterparts. Uh, and per capita, it's richer than Pakistan. How would you define the legacy of this war? Uh, uh, to either of you, sir, because actually, if you look at this, uh, there have been uh, quote unquote humanitarian interventions that that many great powers have done. In fact, many countries in the West as well. And without, uh, ex uh, you know, one can't think of any of the humanitarian interventions which have actually gone well. Uh, many of those countries, including some uh, even in our region, are significantly worse off uh, than they were before the humanitarian intervention. And Bangladesh, uh, which was relatively poorer than West Pakistan in any case, and West Pakistan had exploited it terribly, conducted a genocide out there. Uh, the legacy of this war uh, has been positive. Bangladesh is actually richer than their former uh, oppressors now. How do you see the legacy of this war? To any of you. Well, Amish, uh, uh, I'd start uh, first if uh, I have your permission, Kamal. Please, please, please. Okay. Well, you know, you have this concept in uh, Indian history of the Dharmic youth, which is a, a war waged for righteous reasons. Uh, yeah. It's almost a, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense. I mean, wars are not righteous. They're not just, there's nothing righteous about warfare itself. We, we, we've seen the kind of uh, bloodshed that's being inflicted uh, in Europe on our TV screens as we speak. But the 71, 1971 war, the liberation of Bangladesh was a glorious example of a righteous war. It was preceded by a genocide in March uh, 1971. And for that, to understand the contours of this uh, genocide, you have to read an article written in the Sunday Times uh, of the UK uh, by a Pakistani journalist called Anthony Mascarenas. Mm -hmm. who wrote that article at great personal risk to his life, uh, where he actually outlined the contours of what the Pakistan military was doing in East Pakistan in 1971. They were trying to erase the entire idea of uh, you know, uh, Bangladeshi nationhood by systematically identifying uh, and targeting and eliminating, cleansing, they call those. They use these kind of words that you thought had gone out of fashion after the Second World War. Genocide and ethnic cleansing and all of that. Our uh, operation, the Indian response to that genocide is an example of a righteous war. And this is a perfect example of how humanitarian interventions ought to be uh, carried out. There was a lot of restraint that was uh, displayed by India uh, in the early months of the war. And let's not forget that we were ranged against uh, literally every country in the world at that point. You had the United States backing Pakistan, the Pakistani military dictatorship. And you had China, which was an ally of Pakistan then, which uh, the United States, as it now emerges, the U.S. was goading China uh, to, uh, you know, mobilize troops along the uh, uh, line of actual control with India so that we would be distracted and not focus on East Pakistan. So all kinds of, uh, you know, international uh, machinations were on to prevent India from intervening on the side of the Bangladeshi people. And when they finally did, they delivered those uh, hammer blows of the armed forces in, in that 14-day war in December, culminating in the birth of Bangladesh. And a few weeks later, the Indian armed forces, having you know, uh, uh, pronounced mission accomplished, they stepped out away from Bangladesh and they let the people of Bangladesh decide their destiny. And 50 years later, as you, uh, as Humphrey Hawksley mentioned in that question, I mean, you have the most shiny example of the country that was literally uh, being uh, erased by their oppressors, now doing better than their oppressors. And this to me is the ultimate victory of the Bangladeshi people from 1971. Very true. Very true. Sorry, if you have... Yes, you I, I... Yeah, there is, there is... I see one more question. I mean, um, uh, should we uh, allow the questioner? Uh, if there's someone... Uh, I see Uma. Uma Kabe. I think she has a question. 
and uh, uh, we'd like to see what she uh, hello everyone thank you for giving me this opportunity it was a very insightful discussion uh, so my question is to both uh, Shri, uh, Sandeep Punithan as well as to Commodore Shrikant Kesmoor. Uh, as you both are very interested in naval history, uh, so I have read your book, sir, and I find the story of Ines Panvel incredibly interesting. Uh, as a person from Mumbai, I'm proud of its legacy. Uh, while the Navy may be sometimes uh, named on ship on uh, called Panvel, how can the citizens of Mumbai uh, and Panvel celebrate its uh, this great ship and its exploits. So uh, that's a good question, Uma. Uh, should I take that? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You you mm -hmm. go ahead first. <laughs> you yeah, go ahead I, first. I right. just a bit. Yeah. It, it's uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. It's very interesting that the uh, uh, Panvel was one of a, a number of uh, Soviet-supplied patrol uh, craft that was sold to the Indian Navy in the 1960s, and they were named after small towns and suburbs of India, uh, I think keeping in with the size of these ships. So you had the Panvel, you had the Pamban, the Pulikat, very cute little names of suburbs that you might not have heard. But Panvel, as you all know, is uh, a small suburb on the outskirts of uh, Mumbai in Thani district. Now, there's every reason that uh, the uh, citizens of Panvel should be really proud of this, the fact that a ship named after their uh, a suburb after their town has brought such great glory uh, to the country and indeed to the Indian Navy. And, uh, you know, uh, we've been discussing this in the past uh, with uh, Komro Srikant. There's possibly some way that we could commemorate this in Panvel itself by, you know, either naming um, a, a part of uh, Panvel after the ship or, you, you know, even having a small uh, a plaque or a model of that ship over there to just remember that glorious uh, chapter from 1971. The only uh, successful Indian, uh, the only, in fact, the only Indian riverine gunboat raid uh, of the last 75 years or so. And it's a remarkable achievement of that uh, gallant little ship that, you know, against all odds, it uh, escaped that, uh, that those unfortunate circumstances and continued with the mission, completed the mission, picked up the survivors and returned home for which our uh, captain, that's uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, J.P. N. Arona, was very richly, uh, uh, you know, uh, deservedly awarded uh, Mahavir Chakra. Uh, yeah, if if I can add, I think Sandeep has put it very beautifully. But you know, uh, Uma, uh, in a way, one reason I think you underscored an important point about citizen participation in these, and and one reason we have. Uh, webcast like this with, with someone like Amish and the Nehru Center involved is to actually take home the message of unknown facets of the 71 war. Uh, as, as Sandeep said, the Navy itself was considered a silent service. So not much is known of what the Navy did. And within that subcomponents, heroic stories that emerge, whether it is a missile boats, whether it's an aircraft carrier and whether it is ships like Panvel. I think all of them need celebration. And while the Navy does its bit by putting information in the public, a lot more needs to be done possibly by citizens, by concerned citizens. And I think you underscored a very important point. Heroes like uh, 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 Narona, who was, who was commanding and got the Mahavir Chakra. And and the remarkable thing is this small small number of people, Kapil sir or Sandeep can bring, I think there were there were 30, 40 odd people who got a record number of Mahavir Chakras, Veer Chakras, and Nausana Gallantry Medals. I think pro rata basis, probably more than even the Army and Air Force. This small bunch that constituted the Force Alpha got the highest number of gallantry awards. So, so I think in some ways you're right. This needs much greater commemoration uh, by the citizens of Panvel. In 1971, Panvel was probably, as Sandeep talked, a small, uh, somewhat sleepy part outskirts of Mumbai. Today, it is active, bustling with an identity of its own. And I'm sure uh, any commemoration of INS Panvel, the ship, will further make Panvel, the town, Panvel, the metropolis, a more attractive place. You know, so, so that's what I feel about this, you know. Thank you, Mama. I, I hope you are happy with the answers. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Uma. 
Uh, yeah. Shikhan, there's I noticed there's another uh, questioner, uh, someone called Abhijit uh, Patel. Uh, perhaps if we can bring him up on stage. Uh... Abhijit, uh, or maybe we... hello everyone. Ah, hello everyone. Ah, hi, hi Abhijit. Hi, go hi. ahead. Please, please do ask your question. It then. is an interesting. It is an extremely interesting discussion. I have a question that could be answered by both uh, Commander Kapil as well as Commodore Shikhan Kesno. As a person interested in naval history, to me, uh, above everything, Operation X symbolizes boldness at the strategic level of leadership and at the tactical level of execution. Also, boldness was seen in other exploits of the Indian Navy in 71 war as well. Would you agree? And what are the lessons for future wars does this carry? Uh, Kapil, sir, Kapil, sir, would you? Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, <clears throat> the um, planning and execution were different in this because the situation was different. We had uh, people from another country looking for assistance from us, whom we trained and used them to further their aims. Uh, so th th this clandestine operation was nearly, uh, really uh, something which was planned, conceived and uh, executed by Indian Navy. But the people who really delivered the blow, who really delivered the weapons into the field were the people themselves who were looking for um, uh, liberating their country. So that way it was different. One could openly do it. In in um, uh, others, any in any other situation, the um, political will may be different. So, um, uh, any any other points you wanted me to cover? Uh, sir, I think he he was he was you you brought out um, uh, from the political will uh, downwards. Uh, if if I guess right, he, he did mention, and I think that has been brought out amply in our discussions too, uh, by Sandeep as well as you, uh, that there was lots of uh, uh, boldness in in both the planning and the and the execution, right from the topmost strategic uh, to the tactical levels, and that was seen everywhere. Uh, courage on ground, which got us lots of awards. But also, also boldness and top, which which made this mission possible. You know, anyone could have chickened out, but but they didn't. And I think that's that's remarkable. And he has a point. If I can just elaborate a little bit, uh, Abhijit, uh, I think one of these lessons, of course, is boldness, uh, uh, and that comes out. And and some of the takeaways clearly from seventy one war. One is. As, as Sandeep and Kapil sir both have brought out, it was joint, uh, and it was it was sort of with all all elements of national power coming together. I think that was very remarkable. Uh, the second point is is of a certain offensive spirit that the Navy showed, uh, notwithstanding the constraints, whether it was about the attack on Karachi, using the aircraft carrier, uh, this mission. It was about showing a certain, you know, can do, want to be a part of the battle and the offensive spirit. I think that that was very important. You know that that offensive action is one of the principles of war. So I think that came out very well here. The third also, which both our panelists have brought out, it is a team effort. You know, war is always team effort. And for every flamboyant person, you need a person who looks after the detail. So if Admiral Nanda was a big picture man, you needed someone to fill in details and someone like Mickey Roy comes in. Jal Karsidji, Admiral Nanda's vice chief, was a man of great detail, as has been pointed out. So if you had flamboyant characters like Krishnan, you had people with eye for detail like Karsidji. So I think the Navy was enormously blessed in 1971 to have had a huge cast of characters who made who made for a wonderful cricket team you know it had everyone uh, the the fast bowlers the batsmen the wicket keepers the great fielders the all rounders and i think uh, one of the abiding lessons of this war is that uh, it takes a team to make such things possible 
and you need all sorts of players in that team. Of course, there are many more lessons, but I think you brought out that that boldness and offensive spirit characterized the Navy's approach in this in this war, uh, uh, and and as did uh, you know the the spirit of the Bangladesh people too. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you for your question. Uh, uh, Shrikant, are there any more questions? It's been a... And it's it's nearly two hours, but I didn't even note it. Nearly two hours. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll be having lots of questions, but I think we need to wrap up. Otherwise, yeah. you know... And we need to let our guests go. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe we have closing comments from both the guests and then uh, I'll say something and hand over to you. Sure. Uh, uh, any closing comments, okay. sir? Uh, first, Commander Kapil and then uh, Sandeep. Um, it's, uh, you know, like um, as uh, it was brought out earlier and you had also brought out the uh, operations, which uh, how much uh, recognition had been um, earned by the participants. So th this particular um, operation, I think uh, Sandeep would uh, bear out. I think there were there were three Mahavir Chakras in Sami's uh, group. There were six Veer Chakras. There are about uh, 12 Navsena medals and a Vishis Seva medal. So it was a, quite a rich haul. And, uh, you know, the number of people, as you had pointed out earlier, also were very limited. That. A crew of uh, Punwell and rest another about 20, 20 odd officers and sailors. That's it. That was the whole team. Well, uh, uh, if uh, I were to add to what Commander Kapil just said, it's always about the right man for the right job and always the man behind the machine. And that, that's been mm -hmm. my learning of writing this book with uh, Captain Salmon and you know meeting such legends like uh, Commander Kapil and many others who've been part of this operation. It's that we give too much of importance to technology at times mm -hmm. without realizing that, you know, at it's always the man behind the machine and that lesson uh, cannot be repeated enough. And I, I think what these small, the small group of uh, officers and sailors, what they achieved in, com uh, you know, complete the disproportion to their numbers is just a testament of that man behind the machine always matters. So true. Man behind the machine. And I think that's, that's, in a way, it, it summarizes what we are trying to say in our discussion, that it's always the man behind the machine uh, or in in battles of the future, uh, men and women behind the machine who, who will uh, ultimately dictate the outcome of the war. You know, Amish, one of the most fascinating things about this is that this is, this is both a remarkable, remarkable mission characterized by everything, courage, boldness, innovativeness, ingenuity. And there is a book that does full justice to that mission and brings it out, which makes for compelling reading. So, so it's, it's both a great mission and a great book. And I would think uh, that if, if some of our listeners have not, not read this, they must go. Uh, I, I personally would like to see this being made into a huge, huge Bollywood movie with a great star cast. And interestingly, interestingly, Sandeep dedicates this book uh, to, to the people of Bangladesh. So I think there is a message in that. Uh, I think that's, that's a great note to end this discussion on uh, about Operation X and, and everything that, that it meant. Over to you now. You know, I'm, uh, so many learnings from, uh, from this event. Uh, uh, Commander Kapil sir, Sadeep, uh, Shrikan, thank you so much for this. And there are two things which actually stand out to me. And I'm going to use popular culture uh, uh, symbology to make it uh, uh, relevant. As Sandeep rightly uh, dedicated the book uh, to the people of Bangladesh, uh, you know, this truly was uh, you know, jointness, not just within uh, uh, the various uh, services. Uh, but uh, between India and Bangladesh and to use a popular culture symbology, this was like Jai and Viru fighting Gabbar Singh because if there's one country which had no redeeming features at that time, it was certainly Pakistan, the Gabbar Singh of that war. Uh, and uh, truly was a joint effort uh, and uh, uh, friends uh, which, uh, which uh, helped each other. 
and uh, bangladesh has uh, has has been a stunning success over the last 50 years and that truly is what this uh, war achieved and which brings me to the second point building on what sandeep said this truly was a dharmic war uh, there are many uh, powers which uh, which aim to do humanitarian wars uh, today and as history has been been witness uh, they have usually left their countries worse uh, uh, than they found it when they uh, when they would have intervened for whatever humanitarian uh, causes uh, that, uh, that that they would have found worthy uh, but the 71 war is truly a humanitarian dharmic war which achieved good uh, bangladesh is so much uh, better off than it was when pakistan was conducting uh, uh, genocides and exploiting uh, that land and uh, india truly just helped the friends and then just stepped back and let uh, the Bangladeshis themselves decide uh, their own future. Um, I'm so delighted that the Nehru Center has got the opportunity to be a part of uh, of of, uh, of commemorating this uh, remarkable war, the 1971 war. This is only the third in a series, and we'll soon come back to you with another one. Both Shrikant and I will come back to you with another webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Namaste. Jai. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.